Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a big privilege for me to announce the Elsass Foundation Prize Lecture. And an honor to welcome Hank Chambers from the United States. Hank uh, is a professor in pediatric orthopedic surgery in uh, San Diego and part of the University of California, San Diego. He is also working at the Rady Children's Hospital and is the director of the Southern Family Cerebral Palsy Foundation. I have mainly met Hank through our sister organization, the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, where Hank was president. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Maybe, maybe we will hear that. I have also uh, met Hank through the research literature. Actually, when I started my career, it was very much in uh, movement control and gait. And one of the big gurus at that time was Donald Sutherland. And Hank was then, I think, a young doctor working in his lab and collaborating and doing a lot of, of gait studies. Uh, later, Hank has also been instrumental in setting up the muscle pathophysiology research in San Diego, where he did what we could call really translational research, collaborating as a clinician with uh, Rick Lieber and others doing the more morphological part, which has really contributed a lot to our understanding of the pathophysiology in, in particular cerebral palsy. But that is one side. Uh, the other side of Hank is that he is the father of a son, 70, 70, 7, 37 years old son with cerebral palsy. So that means that Hank is not only seeing the children with cerebral palsy from a professional side, but also as a parent and a caregiver. And nowadays we are becoming more and more aware of how important it is to see that parents are not just passive receivers, they should actually be very much involved in set, setting goals and the vision what we want to achieve with, with our services. So therefore I think it's, it's a very good timing now to let Hank talk about the views from no, let's see if I get it correct. You have it there, a view from both sides. So please, Hank. Thank you very much, Hans. It's uh, such an honor to be asked to give a keynote speaker at the EACD. Um, I've always enjoyed the meeting and uh, enjoy um, all the, um, my friends there, um, work, working with them throughout my life. Um, as uh, Hans mentioned, um, I have an adult son with cerebral palsy. And about 20 years ago, I was in uh, Melbourne and Dr. Kerr Graham, who's one of my mentors, um, suggested that I combine, a, to, to kind of give a talk combining those two. And I'd never done that before. Um, and it certainly made me think more about my career and, um, and also how I look at cerebral palsy. And so there's a lot of philosophy in this talk and maybe a little bit of science, but I hope, hope we can get, go through this. I have some um, personal disclosures. Um, <clears throat> I'm a consultant with Allergan Corporation and with Orthopediatrics and have several grants um, from the, the companies below, including the NIH. Um, but my biggest um, bias is that I've got, I got funding from the Southern family from Alberta, Canada, who have uh, recently funded a new gate lab and a, a new lab and research at Rady Children's Hospital. Um, in the United States, um, just until recently, botulinum toxin was not approved for use in children, but it just recently has. Um, I'm going to talk about intrathecal baclofen, which in the United States is not approved for use in dystonia. Um, but if you um, think about it, in the United States, at least 50% of the drugs that we use are not specifically indicated um, for, for children. So, so what is cerebral palsy? When I was a resident, I was uh, taught that it's due to brain damage. And right now, if you go, brain damage due to obstetrical trauma. So if you go right now and to the, um, the internet and Google cerebral palsy, you're gonna find some great websites 
Um, it turns out they're all run by lawyers who are trying to get you to sue the obstetrician. Um, was the baby too small or too big? Is that the cause of it? Well, nobody, um, that, there was a lot of questions when I started my um, training in the early 80s. One, here's a, the, the definition by Bax et al. and many of the leaders of our academy and, um, in, it was published in Developmental Medicine now 14 years ago. And the, I guess the big thing about it, this is a non-progressive disturbance of the infant brain and that it affects the entire body, sensation, perception, um, communication, and then also the secondary musculoskeletal problems. And, um, and of course, it, um, by definition, it occurs before the age of three. When we, um, I know that many of you are very sophisticated in this area, but hopefully there, maybe there's some trainees listening today. But um, as we talk about cerebral palsy, I like to say what Eve Blair calls the cerebral palsies. And actually it was note, mentioned even at uh, Freud's time that they were the cerebral palsies, that it's not a single disease and there's not a single etiology for it. But we know that there's a higher risk in children who are um, born prematurely um, or very small, um, uh, very low birth weights. But how most children with cerebral palsy are not premature. They were born full term. Um, but 10% of those less than 28 weeks will have cerebral palsy. In a study at the, the United States Center for Disease Control, um, looking at three states, the prevalence in eight-year-olds was about 3.8 patients per 1,000, which is a little bit higher than we talk about. Usually it's uh, one to two or um, two to three, but this is a little bit higher. Um, and so that means about one in 278 uh, newborn children will have one, some, some sort of cerebral palsy. In the United States, there are about 10,000 new diagnoses each year. In America, about a million people have cerebral palsy. And the thing that's really changed over my lifetime is that there's a, a 30 year, the 30 year survival rate is um, about almost 90%. And this wasn't true in the earlier times where the more, the children who are more severely involved uh, didn't make it into even young adulthood. Um, in the United States, there's a higher prevalence in our uh, black population. There's a, me a lot of different reasons for that. It may be access to healthcare um, and other socioeconomic causes um, with that. However, um, even though most of us take care of children or, or pediatric providers, there are now more adults with cerebral palsy than children with cerebral palsy. And we have to remember that. And I think our, uh, um, our academies are, are realizing that and uh, addressing, addressing this need. In the United States, about 54 million uh, people have a disability. And I like to say that if you think about it, everyone who's listening to this talk will either be disabled someday or will be dead. So you'll be using a walker, you'll be using a wheelchair, um, you're using a cane, have a hard time going up and down stairs, um, but it's going to affect you. Um, a lot of people with cerebral palsy would like to work. Uh, my son is one of them now, but he's unemployed. 72% of, of uh, adults with cerebral palsy are unemployed. Um, if you look at the lifetime cost of a child born with cerebral palsy, it's about $1 million. If so, that's think of the, there's already, uh, as I told you, it's a million people who have um, cerebral palsy. So a million, million people, um, a million people with a million dollars. What are the etiology of the cerebral palsies? I'm not going to go through all of these because we don't have time. And it's also been covered by many fantastic lectures during this um, conference. The, um, I will like to bring up a couple things and um, to now bring it back more personally. Um, when I was an intern in uh, 1987, no, 1982, when I was an intern, my um, wife was pregnant with twins and um, one of our twins died in utero. We um, didn't know exactly why and that was, he, he died at, at, at 28 weeks. Um, about two weeks later, my wife had a, um, you know, that she was getting, she was getting a little bit sicker and she had an abruption of her placenta and had an, emer an emergency C-section. And my son was born at 30 weeks. He weighed two pounds, nine ounces. And um, 
that so obviously that's horrible. We, we everybody's. I mean, not there is, it, it's tough to go through that. But then we started. You know, we never knew why. You know, and that's the question that parents always ask: Why does my child have cerebral palsy? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. One of them is um, they could have some chromosomal abnormality or brain abnormality from development. Um, and this kind of goes together with the genetic influences. But there are genetic influences both from the um, of that the child might have, as we're finding with many of the new genomic studies that we're doing, but also that there are genetic influence from the mother. So mothers who have multiple miscarriages um, have incompetent uteri um, can contribute to the um, the child being born prematurely. Um, it, it turns out that my um, wife has two uh, clotting disorders, which we didn't know until really 20, year, 20 or 30 years later. And she has uh, factor V Leiden. And just recently, as early as this year, um, we found out that she has a thing called lipoprotein little a, which causes um, blood clots. And she was, uh, has been hospitalized several times with pulmonary emboli. So that was the reason my son, the, my son who passed away uh, died because his umbilical cord was completely clotted off and contributed to the prematurity of uh, my son, Sean. There are other things such as metabolic influences that are listed there. There are um, uh, uh, infections which can contribute to cerebral palsy. And really that cause correlation does not imply causation as we know of many things about etiology. We really don't know exactly what causes cerebral palsy. Um, we do know that um, children with, this is from Jim Gage's book, um, that the, the lower extremity is more involved in the upper extremity. And the reason for that is the area of what's is called periventricular leukomalacia. So if this area is affected, um, if it's closer to the uh, ventricles, these are the fibers that go to the, le the leg, which is down in the sulcus here. And then the homunculus of the, on the cortex is more broadly, uh, it, it's very large and um, particularly the hand, and that's further away. So the amount of paraventricular leukomalacia in a very simplistic way will affect this brain, uh, the brain development. And this is from the, also from the migration of the cells outward to the cortex. Uh, hemiplegia is often due to some sort of stroke, um, and that could also a clotting disorder in children. My, um, my son was tested for this and doesn't have the, the clotting disorder. The, um, but the, I think this, the, uh, the thing that's changed my, our understanding and actually how it's affected my son is understanding the basal ganglia and where they are and how close they are to the ventricles and also why this area can be um, a, a, a problem in cerebral palsy. Functional MRI has really, um, really demonstrated something that we already knew about how complex our brain is. Um, and the fact that I know there are many of you are neurologists and I'm very just an orthopedic surgeon, but understanding that almost every signal that comes out of the brain is affected by other parts of the brain. There's all these tracts that run from the cerebellum, from the basal ganglia, um, and they affect everything that comes in and out of the brain. And um, this is just interesting, interesting and um, really could, un, makes us understand why any brain injury or brain um, malformation can lead to motor problems. So ideally what we'd like to do is what we did with polio is prevent cerebral palsy. And I mean, here's all the strategies. Once again, I've seen that there are talks about this at this recent, uh, at your recent Congress. I'm not gonna go into them, but um, just know that there, there are a lot of things that, we're, that people are trying in the newborn nursery to um, decrease the um, terrible outcomes of cerebral palsy. So um, in full-term babies who have hyper, uh, HIE, to do infant and brain cooling, that seems to be helping. But any, I think that many of the things that are going on in cerebral palsy are due to inflammation of the brain. And whenever we can figure out how to decrease that inflammation, we may be able to um, prevent cerebral palsy. And um, I think we're getting a little bit better at that now. Well, how did I get interested in cerebral palsy? Um, this is my son, Sean, with my wife, Jill, in the newborn nursery. He was born in 1982 when I was an intern. 
Um, my, I, I remember we went to a United Cerebral Palsy Telethon at a mall and my wife asked me what cerebral palsy was when she was pregnant, pregnant with our twins at the time. And I was, a, as an intern, you just really, you don't know anything. And I remember my one lecture from medical school where I learned about cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy and uh, myasthenia gravis all in that one lecture. And um, I said, I, I think it has something to do with the brain. And, you know, and sure enough, as, as Sean was born, we learned a lot more about cerebral palsy. Um, during my internship year, I did a pediatric rotation and saw my first patients with, with cerebral palsy. But even then, there were, there were very few patients. And um, when I saw them, they were in the hospital for pneumonia. I actually didn't see any of their musculoskeletal treatment as an intern. As I became an orthopedic resident, I learned um, what are the fundamentals of cerebral palsy care, which at that point were just lengthening of muscles. Do a heel cord lengthening, lengthen the adductor muscles, lengthen the hamstrings put them in casts for a long time. And, um, and that was, those are the procedures that I learned and those are procedures that my son had. And I can tell you that of the 29 operations that he's had, probably the ones that were the worst were many of his orthopedic procedures. So, it, um, so hopefully we've learned a little bit more since then. As Hans uh, mentioned, I was very fortunate to do my fellowship at San Diego where I was in, introduced to gait analysis by Dr. David Sutherland, who is my, um, one of my many mentors. I've also been, um, uh, during this time, I was, my two senior partners encouraged me to work in the field and gave me all, that, all the help that I needed and all of the um, encouragement to continue to learn more about gait analysis and um, the treatment of cerebral palsy. And, um, those of you who are at this meeting, I, and I think I was just talking to Dr. Forsberg about how I miss meeting with everyone because that was that's the best part of these congresses and conferences is meeting all the leaders in the field and getting to know them and get their ideas um, in, er, in arenas other than their literature. And I think it's been really helpful. And I list some of my uh, heroes here. So what is gait analysis? Gait analysis is a, I, for me is a very important part of cerebral palsy treatment. I, um, it's, it's kind of um, controversial in the United States. I think um, not, not as much as it is in uh, Europe is a little bit more advanced than we are in the United States. I think there's a couple reasons that it's hard to, um, for people to do gait analysis. And that's because it's very difficult to learn. It's very complex. There's a lot of mathematics, a lot of uh, looking at graphs, and um, and people just don't um, understand it. I think that's that's one of the problems. But it's very important for to have individual patient uh, uh, evaluation. It's not just something where you um, every if you look at a child they have uh, spastic diplegia, and you know this is what surgery you need to do, so or what intervention you need to do. So this uh, gait analysis has been um, very important in my career. And that brings us down to classification systems. Um, you know, if you use diplegia, quadriplegia, and hemiplegia, it really has very poor intra and inter-observer reliability. I know that many in Europe use the unilateral versus bilateral. I, have, I find that a, a bit limiting and actually not always correct because there are many patients who might be listed as unilateral or have hemiplegia, but they have opposite side involvement as well. And um, Maybe I know there. I guess I guess some people that want to split things up and people want to lump them together. I think if you lump them together too much, you might you might miss too much. Um, and it's hard if if someone tells me they have bilateral cerebral palsy, I'm not sure if it's really severe um, quadriplegia, um, where the child's in a wheelchair, or they're just they're ambulatory and, and playing sports. Um, the level of ambulation that people use, the household therapy community has also has limitations. Um, and of course, one of the biggest things in uh, my career and probably the career of everyone is the gross motor functional classification system of, of Bob Polisano and Peter Rosenbaum's group, which has really changed how we look at um, cerebral palsy. And we have to remember where this comes from. <clears throat> and I think it's important to um, kind of go back, back back this because it's so much now part of our vernacular. But remember it comes from the GMFM. And um, when you graph these, you graph these out, um, you get kind of a spread, but with mathematics, you can break them down into some fairly discrete levels. 
But remember, there's a huge overlap. So my son is a level four GMFCS level, but he's in this level right here between here and here. So sometimes some, some might say he's a level five and level four, but there's a big overlap here. Um, so that's one thing on this graph that I want you to look at. The other thing I want you to look at is everything you do, the natural history of all children, whether they're GMFCS2 or GMFCS5, they're improving through the first three or four years of their life. So anything you do to a child at this level, they're going to improve. So I'm guilty, My res I have research of which I'm guilty, in which we have done uh, studies on early intervention or Intro, uh, use, use of botulinum toxin in really young children. And surprisingly, they all got better. And that's what we published. But then when you look at these, these curves, you realize, well, they were going to get better anyways. So th I think that's an important, th those are the two things from, from these graphs. So the GMFCS was out for years and um, the orthopedic surgery community didn't really pick it up because um, it was kind of complicated. There were a lot of words and um, fortunately, Kerr Graham had his illustrator in Melbourne write, uh, draw cartoons. So it was perfect for the orthopedic surgeons. Once we see cartoons, we now can figure out what's going on. Um, so in, in, as I, I don't need to go through these in this, with this group, but in level, level one, um, very mild CP, you may not, they may just be uncoordinated. Level two are children who have problems on um, uneven surfaces. Um, and in the first world countries where the child um, has access to medical care, a GMFCS2 patient will usually have an AFO. And when you have an AFO, that kind of tells you the GMFCS2. Level three patients are using a walker or, or crutches, can push a manual wheelchair. And so the first three levels are ambulatory. And level four are those children who um, use an electric wheelchair or can walk in um, physical therapy. And then level five patients are totally involved. And it, and it changes a little bit as they get into their older ages, 13 to 18. And now they're, um, we go up to age 23. And what we see in the adults is that you lose function as you get older. So why, was, why is this important? Well, it turns out that for, G, for those of us in, that take care of kids in orthopedic surgery, there's a, a, a direct relationship between the GMFCS level and all of these things that you see, see below from hip displacement to the, the choice of procedures that we've done. And prior to the GMFCS, um, I, did sur I did a lot of surgeries on children who were probably GMFCS4 or they were becoming GMFCS4 um, as they got older and with doing everything I could to make them walk. And in retrospect, a lot of those children should not have had surgery. When I see my adult patients now who have had rectus transfers, and um, other surgeries for, for walking and realize that they're still in a wheelchair. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. But the GMFCS is not an a, um, outcome measure. It's, um, it's just a level that you have due to your brain involvement. Um, the, but the functional mobility scale, which is very similar to the GMFCS, is what's your function at 550 and 500 meters. Once again, this is also from Dr. Graham and the Melbourne group. There are other classifications and um, important, you know, not just fine, not just gross motor, but what's going, what can you do in your upper extremity? And then the manual ability classification system and the communication functional classification system. And, um, you know, once again, talking about my son, he's, um, if you, you know, he's a, he's a level GMFCS level four, he's a um, MAC level four, and he's a, um, Q, a CFCS level four. So these are all, um, when, you, when I tell you that, those of you who don't even know him can have a picture of what he's like. I think this is a, the other really important thing that's happened in our life is the, um, the ICF um, from the World Health Organization. And, and that's where it breaks, it breaks down into body function structures, activities and participation, environmental factors. And I've noted at the EACD meeting, there are a lot of, um, a lot of talks on these areas. And I, I think it's really changed the way we look at um, disability. And um, remember as, as physicians and therapists, um, we, we only take care of this area, the, bo the body function and structures. Our goal is for activity and participation. So, um, and once again, what, are, how, what, if, what affects that? 
environmental factors and personal factors. Um, but um, this is this is the goal right here. And so um, once again, we work here, but this is what we want. So this is my son, my sons. Um, the um, playing we're playing uh, wheelchair um, baseball, and um, we've had we have started some leagues here in San Diego and and in when I trained in Texas. And this is him now. Um, well, before the COVID um, shut down, um, he participated in a drum circle every week with friends um, in one of our local uh, uh, parks. Um, so this is this is what we want when it, when you do the the surgeries and um, the intrathecal baclofen pumps and all those things. You want to be having participating and having fun. We all know that cerebral palsy is a team sport. Um, orthopedic surgery is a very small part of it, um, and but we're all we all we all have um, aspects in which we contribute to the care of our, our children, and that brings us to the most important part of cerebral palsy, and that's the therapies. Um, occupational therapy are, um, doesn't just take care of the upper extremity. Um, for my son, um, really teaching him to swallow, um, uh, even form words, um, and chew was, was most, the most important thing in his life. And I think our occupational therapist provided more than any, any, any other therapist um, for that. Um, speech and language is important, not only um, in being able to uh, use the words, but also to understand them. And so that's part of teaching, I believe, as well. Drooling is a big, um, a big effort, a big, big problem. And I noticed that there was a drooling seminar earlier um, today, and maybe some of you attended that. The, um, I don't know if any of you know, the, if any, can any of you guess which American f um, federal agency funds the most drooling research. I'll give you a second. It's actually NASA, um, because once you get into space, the drool comes out of your mouth and floats all around in the in, um, area. And I've actually been to two NASA drooling um, seminars. And the other thing that um, we forget about is visual impairment. Um, when you have a brain injury, um, remember that you, have hemi you can have a hemianopsia where you lose a field. So if you close one eye and then move your hand over, when do you see your hand? Particularly if you have a field cut uh, that's inferior, you can't see the floor. And so you may have the ability to walk, but you won't walk because you can't see the floor. Um, we, my son had multiple physical therapies and um, he, had N he was one of the first people to get NDT therapy. Um, I, I'm not going to say it was positive or negative. It was it's just one of the therapies that he had. Um, he had hippotherapy, and that was he enjoyed that. This is him doing hippotherapy, and he um, and our therapist were was, is, was very helpful and still helpful in our in equipment uh, management that we have. The um, you can see these glasses were um, really cool back 30 years ago, and now you see them in women wearing them. Um, so wheelchair and uh, wheelchair and seating systems. Uh, this is a my uh, very similar this, the wheelchair that my son has. You know, it can it can go tilt in space. He can lift his legs up, He's, um, uh, which he needs to do most of the time because he has uh, a lot of um, air trapping after his fundoplication. Um, and we the other thing that we have to think about for our patients is how much these things cost. So in the United States, this wheelchair costs thirty-five thousand dollars. So insurance pays for some of that, um, but the parents get stuck with huge bills. Um, we have um, we have to think about mobility um, when the people get older, particularly as they become adults. Um, my son um, was home this weekend. He weighs a, about one hundred and thirty pounds, and he's about five feet seven inches, and realized that that is a lot to lift for um, older parents. And so you have these lifts, and these are this is a Hoyer lift or whatever. This is a different company, but um, you can see these work really well in big white rooms. They don't work so well in many homes. They um, they don't go. You know the hallways aren't wide, wide enough. There's not enough room in the bathroom for them. They don't fit underneath beds, and they don't work really well on carpet. So, you know those are nice. Um, this is something that we have built into our homes, which is an overhead lift, but this is also very expensive and. Most families can't do this. So when you think about your your parents taking care of these children, realize that they, they may be lifting this child 10 or 12 times a day 
to toilet, to bathe, to get in and out of the wheelchair, and realize that this takes quite a toll on the parents as well. Transportation is a huge issue. Get, getting to activities, once again, our, to participate in society and um, one of our goals. So this is just as important as doing a surgery on a child with cerebral palsy is getting transportation. And so you, we, you have these wheel, these um, vans, and this is something we've had, our families had four or five of these, and these cost about $40,000, $50,000 each as well. Um, so that's very expensive. And we, in the United States, we have very poor um, public transportation, particularly for people with disabilities. And that, and I know in Europe, you're much better than we are. The medical management of cerebral palsy, and I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are all things that I, I list because my son has had these. Um, the, the, it's interesting that he really didn't get a seizure disorder until he was an adult. Um, so when people say, oh, he, they, they do, the kids do fine, they don't all have seizures. Well, his started when he was 23. So if you were a pediatric provider, you wouldn't even know that that is a possibility. Um, and the, the same thing was true with his, with his reflux. Um, he had reflux his whole life and had some mild um, uh, aspiration pneumonias. But when in his 20s, he had a severe um, bilateral aspiration pneumonia and had his G-tube and his fundoplication as an adult. So um, once again, you think you get them through childhood, but there are many problems that occur in, a, in adults. His latest thing that he had were bilateral kidney stones. And that's really um, common in my adult patients as they, don't, uh, they often don't get enough um, uh, hydration during the day. Um, there are many talks during this EACD on movement disorders, and I'm not going to go through them all, but just to show some e examples. And I, I, I show this picture because it um, reminds me of um, how to think of spasticity in a very simplistic manner. Um, this is for orthopedic surgeons. And so if you think of this reflex where there's stretch receptors, muscle spindles, goes back to the, the spinal cord, there's the internuncial uh, neurons, goes back and then the knee kicks out. And so that's the reflex. And everything that comes from the brain um, is, uh, modulates this reflex. Um, so you could, if, if you, um, so that we use that through GABA is the inhibitor. Um, neurologists are kind of cringing now when I, as I'm talking about this, I'm sure. But the, um, the, so things that are like GABA are, Valium, diazepam, um, Leorosol, baclofen, um, things um, that stop this reflex are, are that. So if you do a tendon lengthening, you alter the stretch receptor, so that decreases spasticity. If you do a selective dorsal rhizotomy, that decreases the reflex arc. If you give them intrathecal baclofen or oral baclofen, it decreases, it's a GABA agonist and decreases this reflex. And it's just another picture of the, the same thing. So the other thing is not, it's not related to that is ataxia in which a, a child has a different width of their gait, of their um, base every time they walk. And so this child has ataxia and it's one of the things that I see that gets better as they get older. Um, here's a girl that has chorioathetosis. Um, once again, something that's caused in the, the basal ganglion in deep part of the brain. Here's a child that has dystonia and chorioathetosis. And so this is something that really has also changed in my life and also changed the way that I take care of children um, and, the, and a big impact in my son's life. So um, as he got older, you know, we, we were always told that he had spasticity. And of course I thought he had spasticity because that's what we called it. We, everybody called it spastic quadriplegia. Well, we, at, and at one of the AACPDM meetings, we had some adult providers come in and show us their patients who had DYT1 dystonia. And we all started appreciating the fact that maybe most of our children who are GMSCS4 or 5 don't just have spasticity, that maybe their major component is dystonia. And this is my son just before he had his baclofen pump. And you can see his trunk is rotated. His head is out of his out of his wheelchair. He could hardly drive his chair, and he actually asked me to take him to the operating room at this time and kill him. Um, he's his life was so miserable he couldn't do anything, 
And so um, after, and, and this once again is the basal ganglia, um, and we now understand so much more about this with, in, with imaging of how this has affected us, um, about how it's affected kids with cerebral palsy. So there are other important um, problems um, besides the dystonia, and this is loss of selective motor control. Um, remember, if you have hemiplegia, you might have sensory deficits. As we controlled the spasticity, we learned that weakness was a huge um, problem, and Diane Damiano was one who pushed this to us and uh, told, told us that we should um, strengthen the kids with cerebral palsy, which is something that I was not taught as a resident, um, and that um, these, these kids are smaller and they have a high incidence of epilepsy. So we, I talked about some of the treatments and their whole courses in this uh, EACD meeting and I talk about this. So I'm not going to go through it much. Um, but the thing that changed my son's life was the intrathecal baclofen pump. And he, he, had, he has the pump placed and he, his, his catheter is actually up at C2. So it, affected, it improved his arm. It improved his speech a little bit. But the downside of being that high is it probably caused his, him to have more aspiration. My son had a selective dorsal rhizotomy, which now that we know that he had dystonia was probably the worst operation he could have and really did nothing but him losing function in his lower extremities. So um, that's why it's, it's a little bit complicated with a selective dorsal rhizotomy because you, do it, you have to do it before the age of five and we know that dystonia may not even show up until later than that. So once again, here's him before his baclofen pump and after his baclofen pump. You can see the quite, quite a difference in his posture. Um, deep brain stimulation is kind of one of the new things on the horizon, and this is um, works pro really well for um, things like DYT1 and other um, focal dystonias, and may not work as well for cerebral palsy because it's so uh, diffuse throughout the brain and the basal ganglia. So a little bit about orthopedic surgery. We this is a things where we do single event multi level surgery, meaning we do lengthen the muscles, cut the bones, do everything on both sides at the same surgical intervention. We want to delay the surgery as long as possible to see if they have dystonia. And the other thing about dystonia that I didn't mention is that if you lengthen a muscle that in a child that has dystonia, you can make them worse. You can um, prolong, you can take a child who has a uh, varus foot and turn it into a valgus foot um, just by doing a, a, t a simple tendon lengthening and that we always use spasticity management as an adjunct to surgery. This is a study by, uh, a paper by Roz Boyd about, and I, this is a philosophy that I've uh, shared as well. In early, you use botulinum toxin, um, physical therapy and bracing. You use casting and um, physical therapy and, and, uh, botul and botulinum toxin. I still do that. Um, but if in a philosophy at our place is that if the hips are coming out at any age, that you should put the hips back in. So if they're coming out in a three-year-old, you put the hips back in. And once again, this is a philosophy. It's not something that we can prove, but I know in my, since I since I follow children into now 30 years into adulthood, I have some 50-year-old patients that I took care of when I first started my practice. And I um, am convinced that putting their hips back in has made their lives much easier. And then this, this, this SEMLs or single event multi-level surgery, um, is done at around age eight to 12. And there's a sweet, so there's a sweet spot where we do, we get our best results and that is at that age. And as you can see, as you get older, the results are not as good and our use of surgery is not as, as necessary um, or successful. So once again, stealing from um, Dr. Graham, the GMFCS level one patients, they're mild. They might be part of the autistic spectrum disorder and um, and they have learning disabilities. Um, these children don't need orthopedic surgery, rarely do. Um, they don't need a rhizotomy or intrathecal baclofen. And um, so, but they might have upper extremity surgery for hemiplegia. Level two patients, these are, this is the spastic diplegia of prematurity um, or hem severe hemiplegia. They have significant spasticity. Um, this is where the selective dorsal rhizotomy um, in the selective cases would be, it's very good. Botulinum toxin is useful in this group. Um, no use, no need for intrathecal baclofen in this group, but we do do orthopedic surgery. And we start screening for hip dysplasia at this point. This is where we learn about and need the different types of AFOs. 
um, to help the children walk better. Level three, um, this is where the dystonia starts coming into the picture. These are the severe diplegic or mild quadriplegic patients. Botulinum toxin and phenol are useful. Some patients will require intrathecal baclofen, um, but we wanna screen and, um, and prevent hip displacement. And this is where we do a lot of surgery on the hips and on the feet. So we do proximal femoral osteotomies, we do distal tibial osteotomies to take care of the so-called lever arm disease. And level four, as the these are, kids are usually non-ambulatory, the hips are starting to come out, kids, children are starting to get scoliosis. Um, and we, our goal is to do surgery or any intervention to improve their sitting. And if they, uh, if they like it, and if their parents want them to do it a standing um, during the day. Once again, the GMSCS shows almost a direct relationship between um, uh, hip displacement and um, in, 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 uh, in children, in adults. So GMFC1, about 10% have hip displacement and those uh, GMFCS5, about 90% do. And so um, this, is what we're we, this is what we want to prevent. This is the hips coming out of joint, acetabular dysplasia, hip subluxation. Um, the CT scan demonstrates that these are kids that are sitting mostly, so their hip dislocates posteriorly, which is something as surgeons that we need to know. So what we do is um, um, a child that has increased valgus or increased femoral anniversion, and my son has had this surgery, we do um, a, a procedure where we put the hips back in the joint, we reconstruct the, the hip socket or the acetabulum, and we cut the bones to put them into more varus. Here's another child, um, and here's a long-term follow-up. And you can see we manage the, the spasticity as well as put the hips back in the joint. Level four, these are the non-ambulatory children with 90% of who will get um, hip disease and scoliosis. Um, and our goal is comfortable sitting. And we also start thinking about, we, well, we don't think about it, we always do that, but we, this is where the, the child and caregiver quality of life comes into effect. And we have some surgeries um, when the hips are completely dislocated and we really don't like to do them, but um, these are, because uh, we'd like to get them before and put the hips back into the joint. Um, so are, we want to avoid this. These are, this is a 13-year-old child with complete arthritis of their hips. Obviously, you can see we had to cut the hips out of joint. There's no cartilage left on this, this femur, and we want to avoid this, this problem. So there are several operations you can do just to make the patient comfortable, including things like a total hip replacement. Um, Dr. Miller has suggested using um, shoulder hemiarthroplasties as a spacer, and we've had um, some good results with that, but these are very expensive implants um, um, for, the, for this problem. The thing that I've been using, and I know this is very controversial now, um, Dr. Graham is very much, and others are against the use, uh, Dr. Goff, very against the use of botulinum toxin, but I found it very helpful um, in uh, children, children and adults who have dislocated hips, where I inject um, botulinum toxin in the muscles around the hip um, in 16 separate sites, um, so I've spread it out quite a bit, and um, I've had really good results. I'm getting ready to publish my results. Um, but this is a thing to do if you don't want to do surgery. Um, this is my son's foot at around age 16. He's had multiple foot surgeries, and this is what his foot looks like. Um, and this is after we did a um, fusion of the MTP joint, and he still is um, very good today from this surgery. Um, this is my son's spine surgery, and he had the scoliosis corrected. You can see his baclofen pump, see his, um, the um, intrathecal baclofen pump going up to here at, at C2. Um, and so these are the things that we treat in a GMFCS four and five patients with CP. As we're thinking about um, caregivers, you know, it's not, we're not just treating the child, we're treating the family. Um, there's a very high instance of back pain in um, children and adults with uh, to take care of uh, ch children with cerebral palsy. Um, I can't blame it or anything. I've had four back surgeries. I can't say it's from that. It's probably from being an orthopedic surgeon and playing American football. There's a lot of mental strain for adults. Um, if, and and um, there was a, there's a, a, a stu there's a, a folklore that 85% of parents with children with cerebral palsy are divorced. Well, someone put that in a, in a book chapter. If you actually go look it up, it's really not true. It's no more than the other ones. 
But in, for the caregivers, the mothers usually give up their jobs or careers to take care of their children. There, um, you have um, many, many people, many caregivers have sleep disorders, which go on for the rest of their life. And then there's also sibling stress. Um, if you bring a child with a disability into a family, it can cause more, more stress. However, there are several studies that suggest that siblings go on to, um, to do um, other, uh, other things um, related to taking care of their uh, uh, caregiving roles. So for example, my son is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon now taking care of children with cerebral palsy. As, as uh, children become adults, this is my son graduating from high school. Um, I've had an adult clinic for the last 25 years, and I've seen about 5,000 patients. And during this time, I've noticed the increased pain, which is probably the reason they see me the most. But one of the things I've seen most um, that's really changed is uh, this instance of uh, mental health issues, particularly bipolar disorder. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as you um, see your older adolescents and also the adults. I'm going to leave this with, I leave you with a few things uh, at the end of this talk. I know I'm a little bit over, but remember the, the seven stages of grief from Kubler-Ross. And it's not just when someone dies, it's also for when your child has a, you get the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And, and I would to say my wife and I have been through all of these. Both parents go through these at different phases. Some never progress to the next stage. And it's a roller coaster. Sometimes you go from one and go backwards and people can't understand that you'll you know you'll go from depression to anger acceptance to bargaining there's all there's all um but just think about this when you're seeing your patients and um and also the the child himself when they have cerebral palsy they're going through these same stages of grief and my son went through these at different times so what have i learned in my 38 years of taking care of children with cerebral palsy is that parents are always seeking a cure for their child um, and looking at uh, things like hyperbaric oxygen, which is very expensive and not shown to be effective. Um, stem cells is the big thing. How are we going, you know, if everybody could get stem cells, would we cure cerebral palsy? We, right now, I don't think we know that. I know there are some talks at this uh, meeting about this, um, and I think it's potentially um, uh, going to help us, but we don't know the answers right now. That simple insights lead to great changes in care, which is uh, the definition of dystonia, and of course the GMFCS, um, that there's little money available for research. There's a real healthcare disparity for children and adults with disabilities. Um, treatment is important, but prevention is the real hope. And there are true heroes who have no vested interest like I do in the care of children with cerebral palsy, who have dedicated their life to the treatment of this disorder. Um, I refer you to the, the F words by um, Peter Rosenbaum and the group in, uh, in McMaster. And I, I'm, once again, I know I'm a little bit over, but I want to go through some cartoons at the end because I'm an orthopedic surgeon. When your child is born, you, you have the, all these medical issues that you haven't thought about before. Um, you don't know what a PDA is or necrotizing enterocolitis and all that kind of stuff. And you have all these other, all these other issues. As they get into elementary school or primary school, you have all the other things, technology, where are they playing, how do they get from point A to point B, and how do they, do they have friends. As they get older, they're now teen, they're young adults and you have work and self-care, where they're, where they're going to live, who's going to make decisions for their life, conservatorship. And as they become adults, medical care for adults, aging parents, retirement, um, what, how, do, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And at the end, all of us at this meeting at the EACD and um, across the world, our goal is to help the people with this burden, um, either to, um, and, and, and any of these levels. But I want you to look at this scale, and this is really about true. Here's medical, way up here. It's a very small part of all of the, all the people's lives, and you have to remember that. So I want to thank you again for inviting me to um, give this a keynote talk. And I, I miss seeing all of you and hope that soon we'll be able to get back together again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Hank. Uh, I think everybody's applauding your lecture. Uh, you. Very passionate. And I think it's so nice to hear, hear your professional way of explaining how it is to, to be a, a parent, actually. I think many of us, we try to 
put ourselves in the roles of the parents, but you have really been there and know what it's all about. We have several questions and I wonder if we could at least take two of them, if you would be ready and if we have time. I don't know when they will kick us out. So the first one is if, if you could go back and change anything in your son's experience, what would that be? Um, I, you know, I, I, we don't regret much in our life. We did everything we could. You know, we, we took him on trips and, um, you know, tried to in include him. We didn't even know we were using the ICF at the time, but he, we, he was in all of the activities we could possibly do in participation. There are several operations that he had, like the rhizotomy and several of his orthopedic surgeries that I wish we didn't do because they were very painful and uh, has, have affected his life. But I, I really don't have many regrets of, of what we could have done to change his life. Now, but maybe not just regrets, uh, maybe also what now in hindsight, what hindsight, what, 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 hindsight would have different would have operations. Different. Yeah. <laughs> I would have had different operations, I think. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had many. Um, if the back and pump were available earlier, we might have done that. And one of his problems now is that he has um, really severe lung disease. And I wish we had done something with uh, his um, uh, uh, Nissen fund application earlier. Mm -hmm. um, in life. And I think th that would have made his life easier. It would have been easier for my wife to, um, to feed him and to keep him hydrated. So it would have prevented his kidney stones. So I think that that would have been something that I might recommend to do earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because our knowledge is evolving and we, we learn how we should have done. Uh, right. But if we then look, look uh, forwards, we, I have another question here for you. What is the intervention you consider most promising for improved participation or other right now for your profession and for your son. So that means both for you as a professional and as, as a, a parent. Yeah. Well, the, if you go through the whole GMFCS level, it depends on where you are. So doing something for a GMFCS level two patient, which might be something simple like a gastroc soleus lengthening and an AFO and getting them out to play sports will change their life. Mm. Someone who's a GMFCS4 whose hips are dislocated, if you put those back in place so they don't have pain and they have motion and they can stand, um, that changes their life. So I, I don't think there's one intervention that no, I could see. But I, I think it was particularly for your son. When, when for, you my son for my son, I think, unfortunately for him, he, got, he gets everything because I have access to everything. everything. He might yes. have had probably more yeah. than he should have had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hank, thank you very much for this splendid lecture. And I, I hope to see you in real life soon. I agree, Hans. Thank so, you so much. Everybody joining us, thank you very much. And bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.